wanted to be, knew what he wanted to be when he grew up. And I attribute that to two or three things. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in Calcutta and in my very, I still remember when I was in nursery or infants, five-year-old, in the school uh, that I went to, they had a cutaway model, a large model of a Cathay Pacific Lockheed TriStar in the break room. And I remember as a child, uh, I still remember that model, going in every time, looking at it, looking inside the little seats, etc., and being fascinated. So that was one uh, thing that got me interested. I remember as a kid, uh, even in class one, in that same school, uh, drawing pictures of aircraft, and I would have the wheels drawn, and then when the aircraft would take off, erase the wheels, etc. So obviously, the passion started young. And then uh, over time, you know, as I grew a little bit older, again in Calcutta days, growing up in the 70s in Calcutta was not easy because that was during the peak of the, the worst period Cal Calcutta has ever been through. Uh, power cuts for 12 hours or 14 hours a day, etc. And, uh, and and so the uh, the relevance of that is that uh, I had this uncle who used to work for Pan Am, okay. uh, Pan American World Airways, and he was based in Germany. And he used to come with his uh, German wife, my aunt, and my uh, German cousins uh, once a year to visit India. And he used to always come from, you know, from Munich via Tehran to Calcutta. And then he would go on to Hong Kong and Honolulu and all these glamorous places. And, uh, you know, and, and to me, uh, you know, the someone working for an airline really opened up a whole world outside of this uh, environment where we were stuck in load shedding and in the very socialist times of India where, uh, you know, you couldn't even dream of such things. So to me, the fascination of the airplanes and then the kind of career lifestyle that it afforded, I think just hooked, hooked me on and I decided uh, that that's going to be my career, you know, very early on. At Dartmouth, I, I did the typical computer science degree because that was right. what people were supposed to do. And I also did a degree, a uh, second major in uh, government, political science. Four years, I worked in Oracle, a great company, but it wasn't my passion. I went to Wharton simply to change careers. I said, look, I need to get out of, uh, you know, the beaten path and, you know, do what everybody does and somehow find a way back, uh, way into my passion, which is aviation. And Wharton was the bridge right. to that. And at Wharton, I was counseled that um, rather than join the airlines directly, which was an option, they, they used to go an interview, why don't you join consulting first? Because then that accelerates your career path. So I joined uh, right. BCG initially, but I didn't... I didn't wait too long because uh, in my in my very first year at BCG, I discovered that uh, a former partner was the chief financial officer of Northwest Airlines in Minneapolis. Right. So I reached out to him and then within a year, I joined Northwest. And since then, I've pretty much been either working for airlines or I went back to consulting for several years to Bain and in between Tamasic, uh, where I was working on airlines, on aviation, the aviation practice. Right. And then I came back to India in 2013 with SpiceJet and uh, thereafter Vistara. And here we are today. Got it. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, it's very few people, in my opinion, who can tell you since they were children in school that they were passionate about airlines. But you had a relatively normal experience about trying different things and coming back to what you truly wanted to do. I think that's something that everyone can learn now that there's a plethora of options. Um, yeah, let me warn you that sometimes all the passion is great. And, uh, oh, it can hold you back. My wife keeps telling me that why could you not be passionate about investment banking, you know? Look at the millions people are making there. And unfortunately, you don't, you don't do that very often in airlines. But then the choice is you want to follow your heart and do what you're passionate about and look forward to what you, you know, going to work in the morning. Or, or do you just want to be ruled by doing what makes a, you know, a lot of money or material, some other forms of success, but not something that really excites you. And there's a fundamental choice all of us need to make. Right, right. And uh, I mean, I mean that, that's a great point that you make. I mean, you know, the, the choice is sometimes uh, binary or sometimes non-binary. But if I were to ask you, you know, through the, you describe your career trajectory through different countries and different functions, uh, what were the common threads that connected you across all the boards? And what was the role of mentors and supervisors in this, uh, in this journey of yours? I think uh, that's a great question. Uh, regardless of which country, and I've uh, lived and worked in the US and in Singapore and in the UK, a year in Bangladesh, in India, uh, a year in Russia as well. Yeah. And in almost every place, there's been at least one or two people who I really look back now and say, wow, I learned, I learned this from them or I learned that, you know, who were really inspirational and, and mentors. An example I'll give uh, from my airline career when I was at Northwest, and I, you know, out of MBA, one or two years out of MBA, this incident happened. 
when uh, Richard Anderson, who uh, is one of the very renowned uh, airline CEOs now, those who know airlines, he, he just became the CEO of Northwest. And uh, he gave a talk. And Northwest yeah. Airlines in those days was the third largest or fourth largest airline in the US. But was never known for customer service. It was always known for being a very tightly run, efficient airline, but actually quite customer unfriendly. And uh, a very good on-time performance and everything else. When Richard became CEO, he gave his first talk to management. And he said one line which really stuck with me, which is that for too long, we've been running Northwest for the convenience of the internal operations, for our internal convenience. It's time that we start thinking about running the airline for the convenience of customers. And there were many practical implications. Wow. For example, you know, uh, the way you swap aircraft and pool flights, etc. you do it because your crew is better placed and, you know, you say five minutes OTP, but you're making your passengers now run from one end of the airport to the other. Right. All that kind of stuff, yeah. So that's one example, uh, and several other examples over the years where, uh, you know, whichever firm I worked in, there have been some inspirational people from whom I've just taken away certain learnings uh, that, you know, that have really uh, been, uh, you know, guiding lights for me throughout my career. That's great. I mean, I think, and that's something we can all learn as well. I mean, a lot of learning happens by ourselves, but you know the role of mentors and the changing point and points in life that really drives us. So Absolutely. before we delve in, I mean, <clears throat> the, your most remarkable journey was your time at SpiceJet when you truly, truly turned it around. Um, I, I mean, it must have been a huge cultural change working at Northwest in the U.S. to coming to SpiceJet in India, and uh, you know you came on at a time where. The, there was a, this company was just posted over a thousand crore loss, had over 400 crores in debt, fuel prices were sky high. And I, I would remember watching one of your interviews where you said the morale was low and uh, you were specifically brought in to turn it around. So looking at a turnaround at SpiceJet from these different angles, which is uh, financial, social, cultural, I would love to analyze your experience doing that. Sure. The, the price story, I think, you summed it up well. When I got there in November 2013, it was what you described. We had made uh, record losses for the last, uh, you know, last two previous years. Uh, fuel prices were $120 a barrel. Can you imagine yeah. that now? Now people are paying you to take fuel. Um, and it was morale was down, and the owners at that time had uh, lost a lot of money. Essentially, they were good people, but they uh, were just struggling to make the airline succeed. And the turnaround actually took part in, uh, I think, two parts. Part one was in 2014, which was more of the cultural, operational, and customer turnaround and financial performance improvement. We cut our losses by half in 2014, but most people measure turnaround by when do you get profitable. By that measure, the turnaround was completed in 2015 after the company changed hands. Uh, and the profitability uh, Profitability came three months after the company changed and a lot of factors came together, including the fact that fuel prices had started dropping sharply. And all of the foundation work that we put in 2014 on the operational customer and uh, loss reduction side, then got the uh, tailwinds of fuel price reduction and uh, new ownership, etc. And the turnaround was completed. And I can tell you that uh, one of the most interesting stories about uh, when I got to SpiceJet, my first uh, meeting I had with all the department heads, and uh, this is not against them. They're you know, very good people and they really were with me to uh, manage the turnaround. But the very first department heads meeting I had with SpiceJet, this is when we were losing money, you know, uh, we were last in on-time performance and all kinds of things. Um, uh, I said, okay, why don't you all present to me your view of the airline, you know, and your department's performance. And each department head gave a presentation and just how well the department was doing. And everybody, one after the other, a dozen people <laughs> said they're exceeding the KPIs. So when they all finished, I said, look, I have a very simple question to ask you all. If everybody's rowing forward, why is the boat moving backwards? And there was silence. There was silence. And uh, the point I'm making is that we all had to then come to the realization that we can't fool ourselves any longer. We can't just look into our own silos and look at a selective set of metrics and say that, oh, we're doing fine. It's not our problem. It's everybody's right. problem. Right. And one of the other things that uh, uh, we did a bunch of things to show that business business as usual was not going to be an option anymore. Uh, the a chalta hai attitude had come to the airline, right, where people kind yeah. of just did the job but didn't really care, wasn't there wasn't much passion. Mediocrity. Yeah, not across India, though. yeah, unfortunately. 
mediocrity yeah. was accepted, etc. So I'll give you an example of right. how we signal that we have to change that. Uh, in the neighborhood around Spice Chair, which is in Gurgaon, in Udyog Vihar, there are two, it's, it's in one of the more residential neighborhoods, actually. Okay. But the one or two streets around the office building were just littered. You know, the garbage lining the footpaths and clutter and dirty broken walls, etc. And so I spoke to my HR and her admin people and said, look, people are coming to work every day and this is what you have outside. How inspiring can it be? Can we do something about it? And they said, well, nobody's ever asked us this before. I said, please talk to the municipality and talk to, you know, staff, right. volunteers, etc. And within two weeks, that entire place had been completely cleaned up. Garbage removed, walls painted, uh, improvement removed, park was adopted. And this was done. It didn't take much effort. It just took somebody to care and ask the question. And that signals to a lot of people that uh, change was going to happen, that we were not, not going to accept the old way of doing things. And this is right. what I mean by culture change, because unless you can change the culture for an organization to align and function in a highly effective manner and in a highly, with a high sense of ownership and responsibility and accountability, you cannot get the results. It doesn't matter what industry yeah. you're in. Right. Uh, and then we started creating a sense of urgency, you know, um, I noticed a culture, the Chalta Hai culture, where people would show up at 10.30 and have long lunch breaks and, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah, I'm just here for my paycheck. So to right, change right, that, right. I started having 9 a.m. meetings. <laughs> and people said, 9 a.m., you know, how do you do that? I said, 9 a.m. isn't that early. You know, in the in Northwest, we used to start at 7 a.m. Right, and right, right. Uh, but basically, did certain things to just show again that business as usual was not an option. And I right. think the majority of the people came around, but uh, some didn't. And uh, eventually, people self-select. Uh, and sometimes... We need to nudge some people out. But, um, you know, within two or three months, we became number one on time and we fixed a lot of the basics. I'll give you another example. Uh, you know, we were, we were last on time and nobody knew the reason why. We said, oh, you know, we do this and ground services would say that we close the aircraft door on time, so it's not our problem. Right. So one of the first flights I took on SpiceJet uh, was out of Chennai, I remember this. And we boarded on time, as he had said, it was a morning departure and uh, the door shut on time, everything. And we were not moving. For 10 minutes, we sat there not moving. So then I called up the station manager on my cell phone and said, hey, why are we not moving? And he said, well, the captain is having his coffee. So I went and knocked on the cockpit door and opened it and said, captain, this is, I had just joined the airline. This is who I am. And, you know, perhaps you could have had your coffee before you came here, before you bought the aircraft. And that news got around to everybody. You know, now I'm, I don't mean to say that all captains are like this. Uh, but was uh, this know. on a moving flight? I mean, he was in... No, no, no. He was just on the ground. On before, the ground. before we start pushing, he wanted to finish his coffee. Before the push, yeah. yeah. So now, I'm not... I shouldn't... Again, I, I want to take pains to say that this is not... Uh, I don't want to stereotype. Uh, you know, our pilots were fantastic people. But there were always certain cultural habits that had come there. Right. And this was an example of where, you know, people just didn't care. You know, door was shut, job done. Captain right. is having his coffee. Well, you know, nobody knows he's having his coffee. Right. So now while that is a very stray incident, it just shows the kind of attention to detail that was required, the kind of culture change that was required. And therefore, after that incident, I said, look, I want an SMS. Those days, SMS was more popular right. than uh, what's right. happening. What's happening? On. Every time the aircraft uh, push a base departure, which means the first flight of the day, if it pushes back, more than one minute late, basically it doesn't push back on time. I want an SMS telling me why. And that alone drove a lot of the uh, performance improvement because if your first flight gets out on time, the rest of his uh, day you know, normally goes well. And a long answer to a short question. So, Right. And I mean, I just want to delve a little deeper into what you said. I mean, as when, um, when you were at Bain, you know, facilitating change at organizations, it is always that you were the external consultant getting the work done for the internal organization. But now you yeah. were actually owning it, owning that PNL and managing the repercussions that come with change. So mm. what are the kind of, uh, you know, promoter level buy-ins or push that you had to, uh, you know, look into to get such an organization, everyone from the pilot to the ground staff and beyond to change in a matter of, you know, within three months and more. So uh, how do you go about doing that? So uh, I have to say that the promoters were, uh, they had basically realized that uh, whatever they had tried uh, hadn't worked. Okay. So the, one of the conditions in which uh, I agreed to take on the role was that you need to give me a free hand. And uh, to their credit, they gave me a completely free hand. And they said, look, we'll, we, we will only 
measure the key metrics, which is, uh, is your losses reducing? Hopefully you make it positive eventually. Right. Is your operational performance improving? Is your customer uh, scores improving? Uh, basic stuff like that. Whatever else you do is up to you. And therefore, okay. and they actually communicated at the time I was joining, the, the chairman sent out a notice to all staff saying that uh, he's the guy, right? And uh, our future depends now on all of you working together to turn the company around. And I think, uh, you see, the company had a lot of good people. Uh, that's the point right. I want to keep emphasizing, which is good people, perhaps lacking a common purpose or, or, or sense of direction or whatever it is. And uh, when they got the feeling that there's someone new who actually cares about the details and uh, sort of is willing to make change, uh, they quickly coalesced around that. So that was very good. That's, uh, that's a great point. And you know, one of the videos that I watched was the holy celebration at uh, SpiceJet on or but right before I think the flight took off or midair, I'm not sure. But mid that, in midair, okay. <laughs> So that really put you in in the front news and the publicity was tremendous. And I understand that it earned some uh, repercussions as well. So I think this is from a culture point of view, motivating your staff. I think, I believe in December, 2014, there was a time when there was for 10 hours, your flights were grounded. Yes. And some yes. of your staff were even uh, ruffled up by passengers. Yes. Yes. So in terms of not only employee morale, but even customer perception, how did you approach that turnaround for Spice Share? See, we so had to, there were two key stakeholders where I can request, uh, I'm hearing some noise. If everyone can be on mute, please, uh, those who are not speaking. Um, see, we had two key stakeholders. One, the primary stakeholder was our own staff, right? We had to give them a sense of uh, hope and uh, improve their morale and make them feel, look forward to coming to work again and, uh, Etc. And the second right. most important stakeholder was our customers. Right. I'm a strong believer, again, this is inspired by one of my mentors in the past, books I read, etc. That there are only two kinds of, uh, you know, a staff in an organization. One is a staff who is serving the customers. And second is the staff who are serving the staff who are serving the customers, which right. means all of us in the back office, right? Right. And if you get the frontline motivated and engaged, then they take care of your customers and your customers then buy more tickets and take care of all of our right. salaries and, uh, you know, take care of us overall. So motivating the staff was extremely important. And we wanted to signal internally and externally that this was not the old spice chip. So after we started putting some basic fixes in place and on-time performance improvement, we started doing simple things like not just cleaning up the road outside uh, our head right. office, but I insisted that Whenever, wherever there's a spice jet facility, whether it's a ticketing office or the check-in counters or the behind the counters where people sit and say, I don't want to see a piece of paper on the ground. This is before Swatch right. Bharat. And, uh, you know, I'm ashamed to say that across airlines, not just spice jet, in those right. days, things have changed now. Even in 2014 and 2013, if you look behind uh, the counter where the agents, check-in agents sit, it was a garbage dump. It was just a dump of paper, boarding passes, baggage tags, whatnot, right. lying on the floor. And I would go there and say, how can you guys work in this filth? Right. And they wouldn't understand me initially. They said, but sir, the cleaners clean in the evening. I said, so therefore the whole day going to sit in this filth. I said, there are trash bins there. I want the trash in the bin. And next time I see a piece of paper on the ground, you know, I'm not going to, you know, right. it's not going to be a happy situation. I was strict. I wasn't just a right. sweet chat, right? And that also sent a very strong message across that, okay, guys, we better watch what we're doing. The small right. details. The small the small details. details. You have to take care of the small details. Small things make a big difference. A big thing I say, uh, 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 that's a big belief I have. Um, anyway, so the holy dance coming to that is once we had started fundamentally changing some of the basics, uh, we started cleaning our aircraft, even things like cleaning right. the window so that, you know, you don't feel icky sitting inside and taking right. care of the hygiene. And on-time performance started improving and we created a new network. We completely redid our network, you know, where we fly from scratch in the first month. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. We said, okay, we, we need to get the word out there that we're not the same old Spice Chip. And right. we had just adopted a new brand slogan. I don't recall. I don't recall what the old brand slogan was, but the new slogan that we adopted was with all our heart. With all our heart. And with all our heart was like a promise to the customer that whatever we do with all our heart. And it was also kind of the motto of the staff that whatever we do, we do with all our heart. And in yeah, fact, right. we had the cabin crew and uh, you know, when they're welcoming the passengers, say the normal welcome would be, and we are here for your, your comfort and safety, whatever. Right. And they would say, 
with all our heart that they would make the sign. And you know, people started noticing that stuff. So we said, look, how do we get the word out? This is not the same old Spice Jet. And Holi was coming. And we said, you know, let's just right. do something fun and entertaining on Holi. And keep in mind that uh, the airline industry in India has some older people like me. Uh, but uh, by and large, it's a very young industry. The average right. age of the cabin crew is uh, in the low 20s. Uh, even the, right. the pilots in India are much younger than what they are abroad. Because it was, right. you know, it's a fast going industry, etc. The average pilot is in his 30s. Um, and the and brown staff are in the 20s, etc. And you know, I said everybody's so stiff and formal, and everyone's got the same old, very stuffy look about them, etc. Let's let our hair down, let's have some fun. So, Holi was coming, and right. we got together with the marketing and cabin services team and said, How about how should we celebrate? And the idea came that uh, let's do a flash mob at the airport, at the gate, you know. Right. Uh, and a couple of songs were brought to me uh, one was uh, Balam Pichkari, and one was Rang Barse. And Rang Barse, I think, is overdone. So Balam Pichkari, we picked. And then we said, why don't, why on the ground? Why don't we do this in the air? And uh, it wasn't such a radical idea because abroad, uh, in many airlines, uh, you know, these things have happened. On Southwest, you have people strumming. Southwest, yeah. yeah, all kinds yeah. Of things. Uh, even in uh, Finair, etc. I, I didn't know that in India, no such thing had happened, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we said, okay. And we actually trained the crew. We took on supplemental or additional crew to do this. And we, we picked eight flights for this and eight sets of crew. And they, did, they were trained by a choreographer. And then uh, mid-flight on Holi, Suddenly, they just showed up in the aisle and they said, we're a little surprised for you. And uh, Balam Pichkari was played and they did a little dance. It wasn't a vigorous dance. It was a very elegant dance. Right, right. You can see the video of it now. Right. But, uh, and, and the crowd loved it. The passengers loved it. And the crew were motivated, excited, created a huge buzz. Only thing is, the next day, we got a notice from the DGCA, a show cause notice. <laughs> DGCA is a regulator. Right, saying, right. what are you thinking? You know, you jeopardize the safety <laughs> of the aircraft and the airline. The, and the, the rules were just a guideline then. Yeah, you made a mockery of this and that. You know, a long, lengthy thing came about that uh, you you uh, jeopardize the center of gravity of the aircraft by having your crew, you know, gyrate in the eyes and stuff. Anyway, so uh, so the funny thing which happened is that uh, this made headline news for several days. In headline news, every TV channel in India was Spice Chair Show Cause Notice, and they were showing videos of the crew dancing on board. And our sales went through the roof. It just went through the roof, right? Uh, so two things happened after that. First, I got a call from my mother asking if I still had a job, which fortunately I did at that time. And then a few days later, I, I got a call from the chairman's office, the promoter. And the basic call went like this, saying, Sanjeev, so you made the crew dance, right? I said, yes. Dance on board in the flight. I said, yes. So I said, okay, this means my job is really going. So then Mr. Maran said, uh, uh, do one thing. I said, yes. Make them dance every day. Our revenues have really gone up. <laughs> So that was a kind of, you know, can-do spirit. And um, so it just sent a huge message out there. This is not your old Spice Chat. And uh, right. eventually we answered the DGCA notice and we had Boeing way in and saying that, look, there was no impact on the center of gravity and blah, blah, blah. A lot of, you know, explanations. So DGCA said, fine, then they, they calmed down. Right. And in fact, eventually they allowed us to release the official video of this, which I will send you a link later. Maybe you can share it with the participants. It's a yes. lovely video. I watched it's it, yeah, it's great. Video, but it's lovely and it's very heartwarming, actually. And it ends by saying, uh, you know, celebrating Holi with Spice Jet. Right. Uh, whatever we do, we, we do with all our heart. And that really set the new culture in motion and made it public. But I also think over and above the cultural and moral stuff, I understand that you even paid your staff when the flight, after the flights were grounded and you made a loss, you made sure that you paid the staff. Um, but this is yeah. a masterclass in marketing as well to get publicity out of essentially a borderline investment and just training to get yeah, yourself yeah. out there, free publicity. Yeah, there was hardly any investment required for this, really. Uh, but paying our stuff was important. Uh, you see, the situation back then was that uh, we could see starting in uh, March, April, May of 2014, that our losses were coming down significantly. They were right. coming down by about half year on year. We were still not making money. We were still running, you know, short on cash because making less loss is still a loss. Right. right. Uh, but we could see that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And one of the things the promoter, Mr. Maran, told me uh, during our, our bad times, you know, when we were really running out of cash and looking for investment and he had already put in a lot of money, he was not able to put in more, not willing to put in more because a good businessman doesn't become good by throwing good money after bad. Right. But whatever, so we were looking for external investment and this and that. And the one piece of advice, again, this is one of the mentor <laughs> learnings, was that uh, 
Sanjeev, whatever happens, uh, pay the staff. If you have to return aircraft because you know you don't have enough cash to pay right. all the lease payments, return the aircraft but but pay your staff. And I think that really helped us because awesome. uh, yeah, when the when stuff really got bad, uh, when we were grounded for a day, uh, and our staff, as you said, the ground staff, some of them got beaten up at the airport, etc. The same thing had happened to Kingfisher two years earlier in 2012. Right. And uh, but they hadn't been paid for 10 months. And when the staff got beaten up, they never came back to work the next day. But when our staff got beaten up, they came back to work the next day because they had been paid the salaries, they kept the faith, and they never right. lost hope. So that made a big difference. Now, there's a slight difference uh, from today's situation. Uh, I'm just preempting the next question, which may sure. come. That because of COVID now, several airlines around the world and in India are not able to pay the staff. Right. Right. And so people have asked me that, look, you're the guy who has said that whatever happens to your staff and now airlines in India, what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are this, that the situation we're in right now go beyond what SpiceJet ever went through. Because SpiceJet was going through a situation on its own. Correct. Uh, but there was light at the end of the tunnel. Performance was improving. And we knew we would get out of that. So we could take, we, we could afford to sort of say, all right, I'll return some aircraft because I know there's a way out of this. The current situation is such that all the airlines in India have been grounded indefinitely. Correct. Only, only, only major country in the world uh, which has grounded all its fleet indefinitely. Correct. Correct. And also the only country in the world where the airlines have been told you cannot take bookings, forward bookings, indefinitely. For cash flow purposes as well, yeah. Yeah, technically, uh, even for December, I can't take a booking now. So that means we cannot earn revenue by flying and we cannot, cannot earn revenue by selling tickets. Right. Airlines are a very high uh, fixed cost business. Uh, there's no end date to this. And in such a crisis, which is completely unprecedented, the survival of the company is not assured anymore. Correct. In spite of the survival of the company, we did not doubt. Right now, I think it is true for pretty much every airline in India, except perhaps the number one airline, which, which is in a different category. For all the right. remaining airlines, beyond a point, survival you know, is in question. And therefore, the situation is different where every rupee has to be saved so that we can survive. Because a short-term pain has to be taken now so that the the company survives and jobs survive. And this is not the time to say, okay, no, I want to be, uh, I want to follow Sanjeev's principle uh, and I pay everybody 100% right. today because then we run out of cash uh, before you know it. Right, yeah, right. If you go down beyond another month, we'd be out of cash. Right. And we're not alone. Every airline is, you know, almost every airline is in that situation. So unfortunately, right. we've had to do something different from what I would typically want to do. Correct. But these are unprecedented times. And uh, I think most people understand that it's better to have a job in two months rather than have a salary for two months and no job after. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think that's a great transition into the next phase, which was, you know, what should airlines and the hospitality industry be thinking in terms of a turnaround? Uh, just a quick note to our participants, our Q&A box is open. So please keep typing your questions. And when we reach the Q&A segment, we will start reviewing the questions. So there's a Q&A box bottom. Keep typing your questions. Um, so Sanjeev, before, you know, I'll, I'll jump straight into what's happening right now is before COVID, India was supposed to become the third largest uh, airline hub uh, by 2024 in terms of number of passengers who travel. There was around $5 billion of investment that was expected to come in. And yeah. uh, there were some regulatory changes to make airlines uh, more susceptible to uh, and more conducive for them to operate international sectors. So yeah. if you were, I mean, you're an advisor to go air uh, right now. And uh, what are you telling, if you could break it down in terms of, okay, on the financial angle, on the strategic angle, on the cultural angle, on the emotional angle, how are you breaking down this turnaround, assuming we go to back to normal at some point in time? So I think my answer is going to uh, apply to all airlines, especially in India. It's not specific to any one airline or to go air. Uh, first is... Um, we have to focus on, like I said, on survival. So cash conservation is key because restarting an airline which has been grounded for two months has already been more than one month now. It's just been extended by another two weeks. So minimum seven weeks grounding would have been. Right. It's not easy. You need a lot of cash to do that. Right. And then uh, we're not, it's not that the minute we restart operations, uh, things are going to be normal and we're going to be making money again. I think the general uh, consensus around the world and in India as well is that traffic will be down. Demand will be down by at least 30%, 30%. That's, yeah, that's considered a reasonably conservative uh, assumption. It could be worse. Um, so in good times, the best airlines in the world make a 10% margin. 
if traffic is down 30 percent even the best airlines of the world will be bleeding right right so uh, we're not going to be out of the world so cash conservation is going to be important going forward uh, that will mean uh, pooling flights redu- reducing number of flights reducing capacity so that you know if you're 30 percent less down then you can't fly the same number of aircraft anymore it's going to be a lot of structural changes required Right. Uh, this is also the opportunity for all of the airlines to sort of hit the reset button and say, okay, uh, what can we do to survive such situations or manage through such situations better going forward? You know, right. our entire strategy, our entire expansion and growth strategy. A lot of airlines are finding that uh, the reason they don't have as much cash cushion as they would have wanted is because they've ordered a lot of aircraft. And when you order an aircraft, uh, you need to every month make payments while yeah. the aircraft is being built. And uh, and suddenly you say, wow! If only I had that money, you know, which the aircraft is not coming for two years, but I would I have to, I've paid so much already because I ordered right. hundred of them, two hundred of them. Right. right. No, and aircraft are not cheap. Uh, typically, a list price of a Boeing seven three seven or Airbus A three twenty is a hundred million dollars. Uh, airlines pay much less than that, but that's right. it's still a huge amount. Right. And uh, so you know, I I think there will be a lot of uh, serious conversations about uh, how do we manage ourselves better for longer term stability and sustainability uh, financially in terms of morale of uh, of staff it is uh, look we're all in this together and we need to get out of this together and we need to sacrifice together i'm working pro bono pro bono means i don't get paid right and i think right. Uh, a lot of senior management have reached similar conclusions are voluntarily offered to not be paid okay uh, that's great in terms of uh, customers i think uh, the demand will only start coming back towards normal uh, once there's confidence that uh, it is safe to fly from the point of view of the virus, that my chances of infection are no longer right. worrying. And I think as everybody, everyone on this call will know, we all read the same news, that the general belief is that either until uh, a vaccine is found or some kind of herd immunity is developed, or the third option is the virus suddenly just disappears, like SARS disappeared. Uh, one of those three has to happen. And only then will the full confidence come back. And until right. then, airlines are all working on uh, uh, minimizing uh, interaction and crowding at the airports and in the, the aircraft, right. minimizing contact between customers uh, and crew, uh, customers and each other, no crowding in the aisles, uh, distancing at the gates, distancing uh, while boarding, uh, protective equipment on board. It's not going to be fun. So even if you want right. to travel, it's not going to be fun because most airlines, I think India will also head towards this, will require uh, passengers to be wearing masks throughout the flight. And you know that uh, it's not a pleasant thing to be wearing yeah. for two three hours. <clears throat> and the airports are required to wear it at the airport. So for a number of hours. So I think people will just start, uh, will, will avoid travel unless absolutely necessary. So unfortunately, that, that, that doesn't help us. So we are right. in a very, very difficult situation very difficult situation and we just have to uh, batten down the hatches and uh, prepare to last this through to outlast this somehow but it's going to be uh, it's not going to be easy right and i think you brought up great points about you know having a job uh, two months from now versus getting paid for now and then getting laid off Uh, where do you see the government intervening in this i believe uh, the coalition of airlines the number put put on was around 12 billion dollars $11.5 $11.5 billion in terms of a bailout. Uh, that's small compared to, you look at US airlines, uh, for example, United and them have come out with figures of $40 billion. So how do you think the government can intervene? And a follow-up question to that is, the hospitality industry is closely related to the airline industry. They go to and to for most yeah. of them. And we have a lot of uh, folks from the hospitality industry on this call as well. So what is your view in terms of government intervention and help and then on the first thing is that, uh, in fact, the hospitality industry and the airline industry are completely hand in hand in this, and they both are extremely badly hit. Not only because people are not traveling, that is a given. We all know they're not traveling, but also because we both have the ultimate perishable commodity that we're selling. A room night that right. goes empty can never be uh, sold again. I mean, it's not a, it's not like a bar of soap that you can just put in an inventory and say, okay, today I didn't sell this bar of soap, tomorrow I'll sell it too. The room is gone. You can't put it back on the shelf. Correct. Similarly, an airline seat mile is gone permanently. You can't put it back right. on the shelf. These right. are not inventoryable uh, products. These are services, right? However, both hotels and airlines have very high fixed costs. So we have fixed costs of a manufacturing industry right. and a revenue model of a service industry 
Correct. And when the revenue dries up, that revenue is lost forever, but their costs still remain. And so it's a terrible, terrible uh, situation we find ourselves in uh, as an industry, the travel industry. Um, I think uh, around the world, governments have stepped in to help airlines primarily because airlines are at the tip of the spear. I mean, without airlines, people can't travel and check into the hotels and can't book on travel agents, can't use the airport. So they, they realize that you have to save the airline. You have to save the trunk or the route for the branches and the right. route to, to right. survive. Uh, so governments around the world have uh, taken various decisions, uh, equity uh, or cash grants or, or credit yep. lines, government back yep. loans, billions of dollars, etc. Yep. Uh, India, we've been in discussions with the government. Uh, there has not been any uh, announcement yet of any help. And I can see from the government's point of view, they have various pressures on them. Right. Uh, number one, they have the pressure of the airlines and hotels possibly saying that, look, it's being done in the US and Europe and uh, Singapore and Dubai and uh, even China and elsewhere, right, right. why are you not doing it for us? So that's one pressure they're getting. Second pressure they're getting is from, um, you know, India has got a slightly socialistic uh, mindset still. Right. Why do you want to help the industries, help the person without the job? But uh, what they don't understand is, uh, it's the same adage, you know, you, you teach someone to, you feed a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Right. You can help the guy, without the job, but isn't it better to help the job creator first? So that, you know, so when you help industry, then the industry will pay, pay them the salaries. You don't need to do charity anymore to those guys. Right. But in my India, the mindset is still uh, much more that oh, all these people are suddenly uh, not getting salaries or without a job. So give them the dole and uh, let the businesses fail. But I, I find that a very backward thinking. I mean, you're letting the right. job creator fail. Right? Right. Right. Letting the people who are going to be the long-term employers fail. That means you're going to permanently have this burden. In fact, in the US, uh, the government, uh, despite all its weaknesses, uh, and we all right. know that they're going through their own challenges, right. uh, very logically uh, laid out the argument when they decided to give aid to the airlines. They gave $25 billion as cash. And right. they said, take this cash, airline, 25 billion of the B, and pay your staff salaries until October, and don't lay, don't lay anybody off, okay, right. until October. And the U.S. includes airlines at like Delta and United and American and Southwest, which are amongst the most profitable in the world today. Correct. And the government's re reasoning was simple to when they had to answer critics as to why you're doing this. They said, look, we've done the calculation. If the airlines fail, what we have to pay as unemployment benefits and what we lose in terms of uh, the tax, payroll tax and everything else uh, and the taxes the, the corporates generate themselves. Right. Uh, if you do the NPV, we're far better off just giving them $25 billion now rather right. than letting them go, right? right? That kind of clear thinking, unfortunately, is not that common. And then the third force that uh, the government has to think about is uh, where do they stop? You know, if they bail right. out airline and there's right. a limited purpose, even if they want to help industry, uh, where do they stop? So, uh, right. I don't, uh, so I don't for a moment uh, say that, oh, they should have done it. I know that they're under a lot of pressures. Right. Uh, we don't know, right. you know and uh, India has its own challenges. Correct. But I hope that at some point, uh, some kind of uh, assistance can be thought for the job creators. Right. Uh, because, especially in an industry as critical as ours, because it's not only tourists who fly on planes, it's become essentially a, an essential infrastructure industry. Correct. People to work, uh, you know, you need to do deals, you want FDI, you want investments, you want uh, factories to be set up, and uh, people need to travel. And they right. can't go back to traveling on train. And we have a real situation of this. If loads drop by 30-40%, if one or two airlines go bust, the remaining airlines also may, may not be able to actually make it. And you right. have a situation where the whole economy suffers as a result. It's a tough, very tough situation. Tough situation, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think we have a lot of questions now in the Q&A box. Sanjeev, I don't know if you want to go through the questions and select or want me to... Actually, uh, I, because I'm doing this on my phone, I can't even see the questions. I'll leave oh, it to okay. you. No, no yeah. problem, no problem. So let's... Uh, Oh, wow, there are a lot of questions. So let's go to the top. Okay, we have one question from Sanwar Oberoi, who is a co-founder of Bohico. I'm going to put him on to see if he wants to answer the question, ask the question directly.
He's a mute. Uh, hi, Sanwar. Are you are you on the line? Yes. Uh, hi, hi, Sanjeev. Yes, yeah, Sanwar. Hi. Okay. So, quick question. Um, do you think that the, the Indian uh, airline industry has enough competitors? Would you say that that uh, should it have more competitors? Um, and and a side question to that is that do you think the the government is making the the rules for the airline industry conducive enough for for competition for healthy competition to exist? Okay. So. I think the government in the last uh, few years has been uh, tweaking the aviation regulations to try to make it uh, more balanced because there are a lot of, again, needs to, to that they need to look, uh, consider. Uh, my personal view is that uh, there is overcapacity. I'm not saying a number of airlines, but in terms of number of aircraft, there's overcapacity for the short term in India because uh, while the growth projections are very positive, the airports are choked. And because of that, the capacity that's coming in is being fl uh, forced to fly on secondary routes. And that is actually causing, uh, you know, performance of airlines to decline. Even the strongest airlines, even before COVID, uh, started having uh, fairly large losses, uh, especially, especially in low season. So I think uh, coming out of this, some capacity rationalization I, doesn't necessarily, again, mean airlines should fail, but at least shrinkage of fleet should happen. Um, I think uh, there are certain things, uh, I mean, there, there are a number of things the government could do to help us, uh, of course, but they have their own, again, they have their own challenges and constraints. Uh, the taxation rates uh, on the aviation industry are very high and uh, they, they could be rationalized. The tax, on, we have the highest fuel, aviation fuel uh, rates in the world, highest aviation fuel taxes in the world. We pay uh, taxes and royalties on all kinds of things. Um, and we have some of the lowest fares in the world. So it's a, it's a tough environment to be in. Uh, we also have some requirements such as, you know, you need to fly a certain percentage of your kilometers on remote routes for national integration routes. And uh, it would make sense if you allow airlines to pool that requirement, say, rather than each of us fly uh, a fixed percentage, why don't we as a group fly, uh, you know, fly a fixed percentage? Because certain airlines have aircraft that can do it, certain airlines don't. And instead of forcing two airlines to have overcapacity on these routes and make losses, you know, rationalize it. So lots of things that can happen. Uh, there's uh, stuff on the ancillary revenues part where India still has uh, many restrictions on what we can charge and not charge for, rest of the world does not. Uh, that can actually help revenue by as much as 15, 20% if we can uh, match the rest of the world in terms of uh, the regulations there. And in general, uh, of course, uh, I think the government is on the very right track in trying to uh, uh, sell Air India because uh, world over, most of the major airlines in the world are not government owned uh, and the governments have decided as so as our government that they are not in the business of running airlines or they, should, or they don't want to remain in the business of running airlines. And I think by once Air India gets privately bought out, uh, there'll be a more uh, even uh, playing field because you now no longer have the situation of one airline which is uh, heavily subsidized and uh, distorting the playing field for the others uh, because they're not necessarily run on commercial uh, parameters. So there are a lot of things that can happen. And uh, I think the government is also probably uh, wary to announce aid straight away because in their mind, they might be thinking that, uh, look, some airlines were destined to fail in any case. And uh, so what's the point of, again, putting good money after bad? So let them fail first and then we'll see about the rest. Who knows? You know, there are all kinds of theories going around about what the government may be thinking. Uh, but as long as they're thinking and uh, they have a plan, we are hopeful, fingers crossed, that something comes out. Great. Um, thanks, Sanjeev. Uh, the next question we have is from Kumar Kinshuk, who is the MD of UAJET, that is a small uh, regional airline. So I'm just going to unmute Kumar. Uh, Kumar, can you hear us? Would you like to ask the question? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, hi, Sanjeev. How are you? Hi, Kumar. Good. How are you doing? Good, good. Actually, we are in the process to launch a new airline in India, UAJET Airways. Okay. What's it Yuva Jet Airways. Yuva Jet. Yuva. Okay, excellent. Yeah, they're launching a new and, uh, and yeah, and what's your and what's your uh, take on because we are planning for uh, in hundred hundred uh, seater segment like Embraer okay. one nine zero. So, do you think the opportunity in that segment in Indian market? See, I think uh, the timing right now. Uh, when are you planning to launch? Uh, our, our planning was on twenty fourth of October. The launch date was on twenty fourth of October, mm -hmm. but we will extend uh, after winter segment after we uh, winter season 
See, my personal view is that I think there is a segment for long and thin flights. Embraer 190 is a long and thin aircraft, which means long and thin means that uh, uh, longer routes, you know, one and a half, two hours, where the normal ATRs and all, they're not the ideal aircraft for that. They don't have the range and they're not as comfortable. And thin means that not full capacity, 100 seater, 110 seater. I think there's a market for that in India. Uh, and uh, in terms of timing, of course, a uh, little unclear as to when the market will fully recover. So if I was you, I would uh, try to delay it a bit, you know, uh, but uh, at the same okay. time, uh, I think there's an opportunity out there when things return, return to normalcy, there's certainly an opportunity. As of now, we are totally focused towards Northeast with two aircraft, Northeast market, that's all. Okay. Are these new embryos you're getting? Yeah, not ever. Uh, it's uh, because uh, uh, right now with the opportunities, what I'm seeing to sublease the aircrafts because most of the, uh, most of the airline are reducing their fleets. Uh, okay. Those who are operating uh, Embraer aircrafts. So we are getting those price, uh, those, those aircraft at the best price. Okay. If we talk to the, if we talk to the, uh, uh, direct to the leasers, they are, yeah. they are demanding a lot, but uh, mm. uh, negotiating with the airline to sublease aircrafts is much more easier. I am finding as of now and seeing I'm the sure. opportunity because, because most of the, most of the people are, uh, most of the airline who, uh, who I have mailed or I am touch with them. They are more interested in that. And even though we will get uh, some kind of a uh, pilots also, captains also, because in India, I don't have, we don't have a captain. So there's a scarcity of uh, captain for E190 also. So I think from the cost perspective and from the manpower, skilled manpower perspective, the timing is good because obviously uh, there's going to be excess of aircraft uh, that people are going to be willing to place at much lower rates than normal. So it's a buyer's market or, le uh, or lessor's market, uh, lessee's market in terms of that. And also, I think because of uh, shrinking of airlines, which I think is uh, likely to happen, uh, skilled workforce also becomes available. So from the cost uh, and uh, operational point of view, I think things look good. It's just a revenue point of view and demand point of view that I'd be a little bit concerned about. But anyhow, you know, uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Yeah. Great. Um, so the next question comes from Anuyai Sahai. Can you give me a minute? Uh, Anuai, you are on, you're online. So please ask your question. Hey, Sajiv, thank you for taking time to speak with us. Um, Hi, so I just wanted a general question for you more about your transitions to, to life. How do you approach any new transition? Do you have a framework or process that you have that you, that you know, uh, that you'd use to summarize yourself to, with a new challenge that you have? So I'm, I, I'm not sure I caught the question. Sanjeev, the question is, uh, do you no. have a framework at which you approach these tough decisions? And if you were controlling the airline industry, if you had the crystal ball to control the airline industry, what framework would you use? And something I would add on to that is, uh, you know, what is your uh, long-term long -term hope, immediate long-term hope? for this, uh, for the industry? See, I, I certainly have uh, various frameworks and I've luckily been able to use them both as SpiceJet and at Vistara. Uh, I think uh, some of the principles that I hold very close to my heart and luckily has been held close to the heart by the investors and promoters as well in these two airlines is that don't overcommit, uh, don't overexpand, uh, measure your capacity growth to what the market can sustain uh, and what the airports can sustain and what slots are available. So be measured. Uh, it's not a, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Uh, don't be in a rush to play place vanity orders of 100, 200 aircraft because in a situation like this, I can kill you. So, you know, it's a tortoise in the hair. So take it step by step, have a solid management team, be patient, uh, and build block by block, but be very clear. I think uh, one of the reasons why Indigo has been such a successful airline is that even before they started, I think they had a fantastic blueprint that was put together by Rakesh Gangwal and uh, others who were from airline backgrounds. And they really stuck to the blueprint really well and executed really well on that. And uh, whereas some other airlines started with just uh, without having a clear long-term vision and blueprint, they just said, oh, okay, we'll get some cheap aircraft and start and then we figured out what to do next after that. But I think when I say go slow and steady, it doesn't mean you don't have a plan. Have a plan, have a long-term plan, but then pace it out uh, in a manner that uh, actually is sustainable. 
So that's the basic framework one uses, at least in our industry that I've tried to use and, uh, and project. And in fact, uh, when we order aircraft, we, we ordered it with uh, specific uh, routes in mind almost. Say, okay, we expect to operate, open so many routes next year and this is how many aircraft we need in the following year. And so it's not a blind order of 50 or 100 or 150 aircraft. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Sid Rawal, who is from the United States, joining in. Uh, Sid, I have unmuted you. So Sid, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Ashay, thank you so much for organizing this. Really appreciate it. And Sanjay, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You're welcome. Um, I had a question about, uh, you know, the, the future of travel uh, after the coronavirus. I mean, there are suggestions of leaving the middle seats empty, but that just increases the cost per available seat mile. So how do airlines deal with, you know, this new reality of what's next? And does, what does that mean for prices and you know, all of us who, who just travel for, for work a lot? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question and there's no easy answer to that. Uh, right. The reality is I think initially the demand would be low. So even without having a requirement to keep middle seat empty, you may end up with the middle seat empty, but that's, uh, you know, that's, that's going to happen by chance. In terms of the requirement to keep it empty, if you look at the math and the measurements behind it, uh, you need at least, uh, you know, three feet. Some people say six feet of social distancing uh, or physical distancing between you and people around you. And middle seat empty doesn't give you even three feet, uh, even with the middle seat empty. And the person in front of you and behind you, it's often just 10 inches or 12 inches when they recline the seat. So the point I'm making is that middle seat empty is not actually solving the problem at all. It's just giving maybe a cosmetic uh, feel good and more room for people to be comfortable, but it's at a very high cost to the airlines because, uh, you know, here's where you re really need to maximize revenue and demand is falling. And on top of that, if you keep the middle seat empty, uh, you, you're just putting one more constraint and one more challenge. And the way to make up the lost revenue of the middle seat once demand comes back sufficiently is, uh, is by hiking fares, which is not good for consumers. And because we are such a price sensitive country, if you hike fares, then your demand falls and it's a cash 22 situation. So basically all of the Indian carriers have, uh, I think, told the government that uh, they don't believe that middle seat empty is actually going to solve the medical or, or the social distancing problem. It's just going to create additional hassles for the airlines. And instead, we want to make sure that we take every other precaution possible, you know, such as uh, masks and gloves and disinfectants and everything else uh, to protect passengers and crew. But uh, let's not do something which is optics, but doesn't really solve the problem. Right. Thank you. Thank sure. you, Sid. And uh, just on a time check, we have one minute to go officially. Uh, Sanjeev has uh, graciously agreed to stay on if people have more questions. So I will go ahead and ask one more question that's more uh, philosophical, and that comes from uh, Chandni. Let me put her on. Pause the question. Uh, Chandni, you're or uh, you're on online. Go ahead, ask your question. Oh, thanks, Ashley. Uh, hi, Sanjeev. Thank you, firstly, for taking out the time to talk to us. You're welcome. Uh, my question is. What is the one learning that you could share with us um, through your journey as CEO? And uh, Sanjeev, to add to that, what yeah. I forgot to ask you during that one learning plus what are you, what is your biggest failure in life that you learned from and what, is your, what are you most proud about through your well, career? Second one is a tough one, but uh, the one learning I think is, I alluded to that uh, right at the start, uh, is the importance of culture change and the importance of uh, not tolerating mediocrity. So it's all linked to each other. It's, it's the importance of driving a culture that does not tolerate mediocrity, that is driven by passion, that is driven by a sense of ownership and accountability, that is driven by attention to detail, that is driven by the desire to excel and do better and to have fun while doing it. It's all about culture. Everything that I said is about culture. So that's my biggest learning wherever I've been is you have very good people often working underperforming or feeling frustrated or unmotivated because the culture is not right for them. And if you can create the right culture, and of course, to create the right culture, you need to also have a culture of trust and uh, open communications, et cetera, all that are the enablers for this. Uh, then you can really, you know, with the same set of people, produce so much more. 
So that's the biggest learning I've had. And, uh, you know, you had asked this question at the start uh, as a consultant versus being uh, actually running companies or right. being part of senior management. Uh, the adrenaline rush one gets from actually being able to get things done directly as an operator is tremendous. And as a consultant, uh, the one sense of the, the, the big positive as a consultant is that you can engage with the senior management and, and uh, influence them to do things, but eventually it's not you doing it. So that's the one frustration, right? And, uh, and sometimes, you know, they may or may not follow your advice, but uh, at least you get a chance to share your, your, your views. But there's, uh, you know, the feeling of actually leading uh, up there, you know, in the front lines, uh, that's, that's a completely different feeling altogether. In terms of um, failures, you know, I've been, uh, for whatever reason, <laughs> I've been in so many challenging turnaround situations right. that I think uh, perhaps uh, a failure or something to avoid is when, well, there was this situation, I don't want to go into too many details, where I guess I didn't do enough homework before I, t I took on an assignment and it was a basket case. I should never have taken it on. And uh, so that's a big learning and it resulted in me not being able to achieve what I had set out to achieve. So that, that so do your homework and uh, go into yeah. something with your eyes open and make sure that you know what you're getting into. Uh, that was my learning from that failure. Sounds good. Uh, so you know what, we're on time. So let's just give a quick closing remark. I'll invite Rekha back. And then if Sanjeev, you have the time, we can continue the question answers after we give the closing remarks. So Rekha, I'm going to put you back on. I think Rekha, okay, I think yeah, she's back on. Uh, Rekha, please go ahead with the closing remarks and then we can move on with the questions as well. Uh, so I think I'd uh, thank you, Sanjeev, for, uh, you know, so graciously uh, accepting our invitation and, uh, you know, giving us so many insights. I think this is a great time also for, uh, you know, this event, given that, uh, you know, the whole situation with the COVID-19 and so many, you know, questions in people's minds who are not just in the aviation industry, but a lot of other industries, a lot of parallels. So thank you so much for coming and uh, addressing all of us. And also a big thank you to uh, all the people who have attended both from our, uh, our Mumbai chapter as well as, you know, uh, the other chapters or people who are not from CMU. And Asha, of course, last but not the least, a very big thank you to you for mm -hmm. taking the initiative and organize this thing. Uh, thank, so, thank you so much, Ashi. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all. And, uh, uh, thank you, Rekha. And uh, I would say the one thing that really stood with me from, from your dog, Sanji was the focus on detail that we need as Indians, that's not inherently in our DNA, that we need to get back on, remove the chalta hai attitude and adopt a long-term thinking. So, that's you know, right. You're a living embodiment of someone who went against the culture and made it happen. So thank you for thank you for all the learnings. Thank you, very kind of you. Thank you. Um, so Sanjeev, if you have a few minutes, let's say five more minutes, do you want to answer more questions or you? No, no, no. I, I have time. You can go ahead. We, luckily, I don't have a plane to catch. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, okay. So let's um, this question from Amrish uh, Chedda. Let me put Amrish back on. Amrish is... Uh, Amrish, you are online. So please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Skanjeev. Uh, uh, my question is not necessarily for airline industry, but the question is generic for other industries to benefit from your experience. What are the key points in the blueprint making process in the current context for survival for the first six months, for example, and revival later on for businesses in general? You mean in the current uh, COVID situation? Yes. So companies which are caught up in this storm yeah. in the next six months, if they have to create a blueprint today, what should be the key points that they should take care of for survival in the next six months and revival um, six months later? I think with the exception of a few companies in pharmaceuticals and uh, Zoom, for example, and others, most companies are suffering from a sharp decline in revenues, right? So I think the blueprint should be first, how do you uh, conserve cash to 
uh, minimize the damage to the extent possible from this sharp drop in revenues, and which unfortunately means uh, tough tough actions have to be taken to conserve cash. That is an absolute immediate thing you have to do. The second thing is that this crisis actually forces us to be at home. Right, and it actually gives us a chance. While uh, businesses, uh, factories are closed, and uh, you know we are not caught up in the daily uh, rat race, to think through what is a competitive position, uh, what have we learned from this, and how can we come out as a stronger player uh, going forward? And does it mean that we need to change some aspects of a business model? Does it mean we yes. need to change some aspects of uh, you know how we use technology and so on and so forth? Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. For example, for airlines, I would hope that they all are thinking about, look, we're going to start at less than half the size that we were before, uh, less than half the aircraft, uh, much less than half I would expect. And uh, it gives us a chance that, look, so essentially we have to redraw our network from scratch. So what should our, um, you know, what should our strategy be now going forward? It's like a restart of an airline, a restart of a business. And how do we fix the pain points that we had earlier and make sure that we now uh, start off as a stronger entity with a stronger foundation? And it all comes down to essentially first managing your cash, then bringing down your costs sustainably, and then focusing on business segments of your business or tweaking your business plan so that you can extract more revenue. And uh, the luxury of time is with you now to, in order to do that, actually. For many of us, we have the time to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. And uh, Sanjeev, we've had multiple questions on uh, 3D and virtual reality. So I'm going to put on Mayank Tibrewala, who has, I saw, I saw, multi, I saw a general theme on uh, virtual reality. So let, let's ask Mayank to ask a question. Hi, Mayank, you're online. So please go ahead, uh, ask your question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sanjeev. Yeah, Mayank. Uh, so my question was, uh, looking at a long-term perspective, uh, would you think there is some scope for airlines to work on 3D holographic technology or maybe telepresence robots or has there been any discussion regarding that in the airlines? Like, is that even an option for them? Actually, uh, to be honest, uh, the only context in which I've seen discussion around those topics is around uh, the in-flight entertainment space where the next generation of uh, suppliers in the space are saying that uh, not only do away with your uh, in-seat screens, but uh, just provide your your customers, your passengers with these goggles through which all kinds of VR entertainment can be provided. So that's the only context in which I've seen VR discussed in the aviation space. I really, to be honest, haven't given it much thought beyond that context. So I'm not really an expert in this field. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so I think, I mean, there, there are a lot of questions. Uh, one good question that I read from an anonymous attendee was, what do you, uh, what, what do you see as the future for indirect sellers, the travel agents post, post COVID, the ones who, you know, take indirect bookings and uh, as a, there was a whole industry that still survives on that. What's your view on that? So we're all in this together, travel agents, hotels, uh, airlines, airports, uh, taxi operators, tour operators, everybody's in this together. And uh, so travel agents make their money basically on uh, commissions or service fees that they charge for making bookings. Uh, either they charge it directly to the customer or the airline or the hotel pays them, one of the two models or sometimes a combination of the two. So we're all hoping for demand to come back. I mean, it's all demand and volume driven everything that we do. Uh, even for travel agents, you know, they have certain fixed costs. For them, it's a perishable product. Uh, the product is the same for all. It's a perishable product, the traveler. Right. And uh, so they also have to just batten on the hatches, conserve cash, maybe take the time to uh, update the technologies. Again, this is a luxury of time we're getting to, uh, to upgrade certain things. For example, the airlines, various airlines I know have upgraded their websites during this crisis. Right. Right. to automate the refund processing, right? Which earlier you had to call the call center to do. So here's a chance to, because you've got a people there still working. Uh, there's not too many bookings coming in and normal work is not going on. So start working on these projects where you fix pain points that you normally don't have the luxury of devoting resource or time to fix. 
that's what I would say. But it's a tough situation for travel agents. Uh, I don't see the world fundamentally changing. Um, you know, it'll business will hopefully come back, and uh, you know, we'll all look look back upon this as a bad dream. But uh, we just have to hang in there until then. I think. Uh, thanks, Anjir. I think we'll do one more question, which I thought was really interesting from Dhananjay Lodha. So, uh, Dhananjay, if you're you're off, you're online. So please go ahead, ask your question. Hi, Sanjeev. Uh, nice to see you staying very calm in this uh, crisis. So I think it's a testament to what you say about culture. Uh, Thank you. My, my, my question was, uh, you know, at some point people will need to start traveling. And uh, do you see the scope for any increase in private aviation? And is there even the infrastructure to support that in a big way? Uh, in a, not a big way necessarily, but a significant way uh, with the airports and the infrastructure they have in the country around that. So you're talking about private planes, corporate jets, et cetera, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think that's a great question. Um, basically, because I think the level of operations, number of flights is going to come down and probably uh, stay down for at least a year, maybe a year and a half, two years. Uh, that will open up opportunities such as airport space, slots, uh, so on and so forth to allow other players to come in where in the past they've been locked out because just, there's just no capacity. Uh, so that is one. So actually there's room or space for, uh, you know, more, more, ent more entrants or more players to uh, participate. But more importantly, I think, uh, especially for private jets, for those who can afford it, you know, capital industry, etc., uh, that is one way to get around the fear of uh, the virus is by just uh, flying in a private jet so, or chartering jets uh, where you don't have to be exposed to, you know, the hundreds of other people at the airport and in the aircraft. Uh, so for mental peace, at least, even if uh, I don't know whether it's going to be a real difference in terms of uh, your uh, health uh, risk because airlines are going to do everything possible to help. But if you can afford it and you want that extra peace of mind, I think the demand for private jets should go up, uh, you know, at least for the next year or two. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, Sanjeev, I think it's uh, nearing 8.15. We can, uh, we can uh, I think most of the questions I see in the Q&A box have been answered in some form. So, I'd really like to thank you for your time. And uh, it's, it's been phenomenal to borrow your mind as... You know, personally, I've hosted Speaker Series since I was at CMU, and we've hosted uh, prominent personalities. So it's awesome to, you know, learn from someone's experience directly. And this is more learning that you get from a textbook. So um, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Akshay. Thank you so much, Rekha. Thank you to everyone for joining this call. And, you know, one good thing about this whole COVID crisis is that we've all realized now that you can actually get a lot closer through all these technologies, you know, uh, yeah. and get, get a lot done, which... Uh, I hope that doesn't dent demand, you know, <laughs> a demand for travel, but it does give us much more uh, ability now to get to know more people and get to interact more Absolutely. in a much more sort of user-friendly manner. So that has been one silver lining from this whole crisis. So thank you all so much for inviting me. I'm really honored. And uh, thank, you thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. Bye.